Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTag.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have several interesting stories that I'd like to go through in today's video, but honestly, I wasn't originally planning to record anything today. Amy is away for the weekend with her partner, and me, well, honestly, I'm working on a script for the next-gen consoles. However, three incredibly interesting stories popped up, and given I've already received a plethora of DMs and emails about these topics, by the way, thanks to everyone who thought of me, well, I just wanted to give um, a few pennies worth of thoughts. So, the first thing I'd like to discuss is Narve31, which is, well... AMD's next generation GPUs, well actually, to be correct, next next generation GPUs. And this is a reference that has been discovered by Hardware Leaks, aka Rogame. And this is actually code which is in the Mac OS 11 beta. We'll get more into that in just a second and its relationship with Apple. But just so that you are aware, if you've not been keeping up with RDNA 3 news... RDNA 3 will be most unlikely seeing release next year. RDNA 2 launches this year, probably Q4 it looks like, late Q3, early Q4. And RDNA 2 brings several major improvements. Feature set gets an update with things like variable rate shading, hardware-based ray tracing, yardy, yardy, yada. But also we see drastic increases in performance per watt. It sees a similar jump compared to GCN to RDNA 1. And we also have IPC improvements as well. Naturally, this is going to be critical in a couple of reasons. One, AMD need a feature set which is more equivalent to NVIDIA. And for two, obviously with the next generation consoles, having these features as kind of a base specification... NVIDIA um, and the next-gen consoles can't have features that AMD are lacking with its flagship products. And so, Narve 21 is going to feature this stuff. But Narve 31, AMD have been less forthcoming regarding the features. They've just said that it's on a future node, essentially. But now we actually have confirmation that it's in the wild. And obviously AMD's partners at the very least have been testing this out, given, once again, it is in the Mac OS beta. It's going to be interesting because we know very little about Narve uh, 30, or RDNA 3. One thing I am fairly certain of is it has numerous architecture improvements over RDNA 2, and from what I can gather, some of this seems to be on the geometry side of the equation. And I suspect that we might even see further improvements to performance per watt as well. It'll be interesting if it's on the 5NM process. That's the rumour anyway. I mean, they did say it's on a future node in a couple of different slides. Furthermore, we also have some um, additional uh, Narve 22 and 23 IDs as well. And... Um, there's also a reference to AMD Cezan, which is, of course, an upcoming APU with a combination of the Zen 3 architecture and the second generation of RDNA GPU architecture. This will probably be rather competitive. It's most likely going to be competing with a Tiger Lake uh, series of processors from Intel and maybe future ones as well. Um, obviously, Ryzen 4000 is the Renoir processors, which are based on Zen 2 and uh, also Vega. So it's going to be fascinating to see exactly how all of that comes together. But getting back to RDNA 3, we can ascertain a few things. The first is that um, Apple have basically said that they are going to move away from Intel and, well, AMD themselves... When it comes to x86 processors, they're going to be using ARM-based silicon. But this is at least telling us that Apple will be sticking to AMD for its GPUs. Now, whether that's long-term they're going to do that, whether it's shorter-term, or whether it's only in specific parts, maybe, for example, for the professional lineup, but let's say lower-end uh, MacBooks might use 
uh, Intel's own solutions, we don't really know, to be honest with you. Another question is what exactly is happening with the release date? Is this very, very, very early silicon that Apple have had access to? As generally when it starts appearing in uh, the drivers, it means that it's kind of closer to release compared to, well, not being in the drivers. And to be really clear by what I mean by that, it kind of seems like at the very least the actual physical hardware exists, which leads to several different possibilities. One, is it possible that we're going to see this architecture release first on Apple's products and then trickle down later to um, Windows-based PCs? Or is Narve 31 some kind of hybrid design specifically for Apple? Now, we do know that Narve 22 exists specifically for Apple, and obviously it has various features that Apple have requested, and we've also seen the 5600 uh, GPUs, which have things like HBM on them. But another possibility is that we're going to see Narve 31 across its uh, several different devices, and naturally we might even see uh, the GPU feature even more compute units than what we have with the second generation, which is rumoured to go up to 80 CU. The next thing I'd like to discuss, though, moving on really quickly, is Intel's 12th generation processors, known as Alder Lake, because we actually have a couple of small updates here. Um, Alder Lake will succeed Rocket Lake. Rocket Lake looks like it's launching, well, later this year, 2020. Although, of course, an exact release date has not been exactly confirmed by um, Intel themselves. However, Momomo on Twitter has discovered some documentation, technical library information, that we could see that, yes, Alder Lake will be using LGA 1700. It looks like uh, Alder Lake will also be using a big slash small core architecture, this is rumoured for the big cores to be Golden Cove, and on the smaller cores to be Gracemont. I will be fascinated to see how this functions on Windows, and also it begs questions like, let's just say for the sake of argument you're playing a game, and it pegs, well, I, I was about to say all 8 threads, but I suppose it will have hyper-threading, so let's just say all 16 threads on the big cores, how effective are the little cores and how do they kind of come into actually helping um, process either games or let's say you're doing content creation, so you're trying to export a video, for example. I would like to see what the differences are with these different cores enabled versus disabled. Furthermore, according to all of this documentation, it will also be the first architecture from Intel, at least on the mainstream, to support DDR5, which obviously is going to bring a drastic increase in the amount of memory bandwidth. From what we can also ascertain, it will still be using PCIe 4, so it will not be on PCIe 5, which is honestly okay, and it will also, naturally because it's on the 1700 socket, um, require a new motherboard chipset as well. Now, I'm not actually okay with that because Rocket Lake will be on the 500 chipset, but also, from what we can tell, will be also compatible with most 400 series boards, i.e. if you have, let's say, a 10600K now, you should be able to plonk in a Rocket Lake processor, should you so desire, um, but if you wanted to upgrade instead to uh, Alder Lake, then you would need to purchase a different motherboard. Now, I don't think there's much that uh, Intel can do about that, quite honestly, because of, with the uh, move to DDR5, well, yeah, it just requires the hard break. And when AMD naturally support DDR5 with future CPUs as well, they will need to make similar changes with the AM5 platform, which is the rumour that AM5 will indeed support DDR5. Uh, well, and this brings us to the third and final topic for today, Lockhart. As you are most likely aware by now, Lockhart is going to be the lower power variant in Microsoft's upcoming Xbox Series lineup. We are now almost positive that this thing exists. There have been so many leaks. It's essentially the worst kept secret from Microsoft. Honestly, I think that they're doing it deliberately. I think that they are 
actually feeding information, to be honest with you, just to build some hype for what Lockhart is, and that way they have a little bit of mystery for a future show, and yeah, I, I wouldn't honestly be surprised if this is somewhat of a marketing decision. Either way, though, Tom Warren over at The Verge has a small update regarding the specifications, and that is that Lockhart will not have a different CPU configuration compared to its bigger brother. So identical clock frequencies, core counts, and thread counts, apparently, between Lockhart and also the Series X. And honestly, I think that this is a very good move for Microsoft as well as games developers. I've gone on record several times at this point and said that I don't believe Lockhart is going to negatively impact development on the Series X. I've spoken to games developers, they don't think it's going to be a problem either, and it's for numerous reasons. If the CPU clock speed is identical, it means that really and truly the only difference is going to be what the GPU is being asked to do, and it's way easier to optimise GPU load than CPU load. I'll probably go into this more extensively when we actually know more about what Lockhart actually is, but long story short, if you're rendering a game at a lower resolution, let's say 1080p compared to 4K, that's a drastic decrease in the workload. Assuming that you're not doing anything like AI upsampling or anything like that, it's a four times increase from 1080 to 4K. And naturally, this also means other changes too in the way that you approach the game. You could, for example, offer textures in lower quality settings, or you could reduce the amount of geometry as well. Especially as things get further away, you kind of get to this point where um, geometry detail does naturally, well, benefit from higher pixel count. Because if you have, for example, a piece of geometry that um, is, well, let's just say being represented by only a couple of pixels on the screen, you don't need so much geometry detail because you literally cannot see it. And I am simplifying that a little bit. But long story short, it means that the system itself is under considerably less work, which means that you can reduce the amount of uh, performance the system has, not just because it's rendering the games at a lower pixel count, so you can reduce, let's say, texture quality, but the actual geometry pipeline itself is under significantly less strain, and this also benefits things like compute-based effects too. Hardware-based ray tracing, because you have fewer pixels, is easier to run, for example. So, I don't necessarily think that it's going to be a tragedy having Lockhart. I think Lockhart is going to be useful for Microsoft's strategy going forward. There's several questions I have. One, what's the pricing for it and release timing and stuff like that. Um, but I think if Microsoft phases out the Xbox One X, phases in the Lockhart system at a decent price, and once again, price is going to be an incredibly important part of the next generation, I think, honestly, 300 bucks is like the upper limit you can ask for Lockhart. Ideally, even cheaper would be great, like 250 would be fantastic. There are some reports that it even could be only 200 US dollars, but I think that might be a little optimistic. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. As I said, I apologise for it being a little bit, um, let's say, impromptu today, but um, either way, I hope you have an amazing day. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.